coming out again. Um, things are strange, as you can see, not how we are used to them, but we can gather together and that's something to give thanks to God for. Um, I said last week I, I was expecting to get some form of advice from PCI about face masks. That has not come, so we cannot make any pronouncements as a Kirk session. Um, if it's something that you would feel more comfortable with, then please do wear one. If, if not, um, then that's your decision uh, as well. It may be for coming in and out, it might be worth wearing one and once you're in your, your pew, that can come off or you can keep it on. Um, the elders uh, will, will try as much, as much as possible, but again, no formal advice has come about that. Um, this week coming up, um, from tomorrow through to the Monday week, um, I will be on annual leave. Um, if you require any assistance in a pastoral emergency, contact the Reverend Andrew Conway from Hilltown and Clonduff. Um, his number was on the letter that you would have received uh, at the end of June if you still have it. If not, um, Desmond has his details. If you get in touch with Desmond, he can get you in touch with Andrew. And then next Sunday, that means I'm away. The Reverend Robin Fairburn will be leading our service in the morning. Um, I thank Robin, even though he's not here, but I thank him for that. Um, one other thing, there was a, um, a brown envelope uh, given in on the gift day in July with uh, a certain amount of cash in it, uh, but there was no free will offering number or name with that. If that was you, um, or if you're at home and that was you, can you contact Trevor? just so we can get the, the books uh, tidied up on that uh, so we know who to put that down beside. But we're here to worship God as his people together. Let's take a few moments to still our hearts before God and then I'll call us to worship with some words from the scriptures. In Psalm 103, David writes, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. So far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. What a great God we have, and the great God that we gather to worship this morning. What a great God we have, and what a great God who knows us. He knows us and our sins and our sinfulness are iniquities as David says and yet he loves us with a steadfast love an unfailing love our response to that then is to worship our God together so let us worship God this day um, we won't be singing in our services as we return uh, hopefully someday soon we will be uh, we'll be playing songs on the screen uh, and we'll be listening to those and reflecting upon the words of them so our first song this morning is Psalm 130, so let's listen to this and reflect upon it. <clears throat>
Consider who you are this day. We also think about ourselves and how and how we are so unlike you. We are sinful in every part of our lives. We sin in word and deed, in our thoughts and our attitudes. For these sins and our sinfulness, we say sorry this day. We confess our sins before you. We pray you would continue to work in our lives to day by day rid us of our sinfulness. We pray you would turn our hearts and minds to you more and more. And by your Holy Spirit, transform us into the likeness of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Saviour, the one in whose name we pray. Amen. For having confessed our sins to God in prayer, having come before him, Hear these words of assurance again from David in the Psalms. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the one against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. If you have confessed your sins to God, then you are forgiven of those sins. God's word assures us of that, and for that we sing praise and give thanks to God. We're going to turn to our, our lectionary scripture reading. If you have a Bible with you or on your phone, then please turn uh, to Romans chapter 8. We've been working our way through Romans 8 um, over these last few Sundays, uh, and we're going to skip uh, further ahead in Romans over the next few weeks. So Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 28, and we're going to read through the rest of this chapter of scripture. One of, one of the great chapters in all of scripture in my opinion so Romans chapter 8 beginning at verse 28 and we hear the word of God and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose for those God foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brothers And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Whom will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns Christ Jesus who died? More than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation 
will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. We thank God for his word. Well, before we come and then think and hear our second scripture reading, we're going to listen again to another song of praise, perhaps a newer song that some may not have heard um, by a group called City Alight, uh, and it's called Only a Holy God. And let's listen to this and prepare our hearts to hear from God's word. We continue on in the Psalms this morning, Psalm 6, again if you have a Bible there uh, on a phone or on a hard copy, then do turn to Psalm 6 with me and we'll read God's word together again. So Psalm 6 for the director of music with stringed instruments according to Shimoneth, a psalm of David. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am faint. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are in agony. My soul is in anguish. How long, O Lord, how long? Turn, O Lord, and deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. No one remembers you when he is dead. Who praises you from his grave? I am worn out from groaning. All night long I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail me because of all my foes. Away from me, all you who do evil. For the Lord has heard my weeping. The Lord has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies will be ashamed and dismayed. They will turn back in sudden disgrace. Well, let's pray together as we come to think uh, about this psalm. Our holy God, as we have been singing, we come before you with reverence and awe this day, knowing that you are the holy God, and yet you are the God who has spoken to us by your word, or revealed yourself to us in your word. We are humbled because of that. We are thankful for that. And so we pray for your Holy Spirit now to be with us as we look at this psalm. Help us to see how it is for us, for your people, how it can help us this day and each day going forward. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm always interested to see how Christians, and perhaps more in my line of work, how Christian ministers are portrayed on TV and in movies. So think, for example, about the Vicar of Dibley, if you've ever seen it. Don French is the bubbly, mildly irreverent, happy-go-lucky Church of England minister. And their congregation are quirky and funny, and their lives all seem relatively okay. Or in most movies, the minister or the Christian person can either be a total wild card, someone who actually maybe isn't really a Christian, we could argue, or the minister, someone who shouldn't be a minister. They're either wild or they're totally vanilla. You know, a bit of a steady eddy type, bland, boring, with the idea that their life is probably exactly the same, bland and boring, and goody two-shoes. You know, a well-organized sock drawer, always in bed by 10, and whose idea of a really wild night is uh, three biscuits instead of two with their evening cup of tea. If you ever ask someone on the street if you went down into Castle Wellen during the week and asked them about what they thought about Christians or asked them to describe a Christian, they may well think of them in, in that way, very bland and vanilla. Head in the cloud, slightly or perhaps even very naive, out of touch with life in the real world that everyone else has to live. But if you got that person to read Psalm 6, it would most likely come as a shock to them. Because it's not bland and boring, is it? It's not head in the cloud, it's not naive, it's not out of touch. It's very real and very raw. It's a heartfelt, emotional prayer of David. And we're going to look at it in three parts today. First, in verses 1 to 3, under the conviction of sin. Second, verses 4 to 7, the hope of the living and then third, verses 8 to 10, the confidence that comes from being heard. First then, in verses 1 to 3, we see under the conviction of sin. Um, 
As I've said in the last few Psalms, if you've been uh, watching them online or, or here last Sunday, we're not told explicitly the exact context for this Psalm. We don't know what caused David to write these words. Some commentators think that Psalms 3 to 6 all come under the heading of, of Psalm 3, meaning perhaps the context of David fleeing from Absalom, his son, but we're not sure. But what we do see in Psalm, or in verses 1 to 3, is David feeling remorse. It would seem that he is under the conviction of sin. God is showing him his sin and its ongoing consequences, and David feels and knows his guilt because of that sin. Look at David's plea in verse 1, if you have a Bible there. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. These words aren't a cry to God to stop unjustly punishing David or withholding punishment from an innocent man. David knows his sin, and he knows that that sin deserves the anger and wrath of God. He knows that he deserves to feel God's rebuke and discipline because of his sins, but he wishes it would stop. If the context for this sin actually, or this psalm actually is Absalom's rebellion and David has had to flee, then maybe this is the point in his life when David realises that in some ways it's all his fault. He had sinned and slept with Bathsheba. He had sinned and had her husband sent to death on the front lines of the battle. David sees what his sins have caused, son rising against father. A nation heading towards civil war, divided loyalties in the land and among God's people. God is convicting David by his Holy Spirit of his sin and his sinfulness. And that conviction of sin is all-consuming. It impacts every part of David's life and his being, just as our sinfulness impacts every part of our life and being. We see that in verses 2 and 3. Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am faint. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are in agony, my soul is in anguish. Again, in the same way that sin impacts every part of us, our thoughts, our desires, our physical bodies, so does God's work of convicting us of sin, bones, 